so this is the time to, to start. And the first talk is by René Thiemann. And uh, I give him the to start. And so. OK. Uh, yeah, welcome all of you uh, from Innsbruck. Uh, so I'm very honored. Uh, and I want like to thank uh, the whole PCs uh, or the, uh, of both Ichka and FSCD uh, that I am permitted here now to give this uh, shared invited talk. And also thanks for the organizers who had to solve a lot of problems in this new virtual setting. And well, let's start. So um, my talk is on certifying termination proofs from term writing to SMT solving and back. So first of all, let me clarify why uh, we are, I got interested in certifying termination proofs. So uh, termination, as most of you know, is just uh, that there is no infinite computation. This is, of course, uh, for most programming language and undecidable problems. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there have been evolved a lot of automatic termination tools, which are usually push buttons. So they just get a program and then they give you back the answer, meaning uh, they could prove termination, they could disprove termination, or they just couldn't figure out within uh, some reasonable time limit. Okay, uh, and um, well, there are many of these tools uh, and there is also an annual competition, uh, for instance, here uh, on the slide, you find all of the participants of last year's uh, competitions. So um, what we have is that we have this automatic termination tools and there are powerful search engines. Uh, they are highly optimized. Uh, so there is complex software and therefore they're also to a certain extent unreliable. So what happened in the competition in 2004 is, uh, well, there were certain problems like this program one um, where only one tool was able to solve the system and said, yes, this is terminating all the other tools said, well, we don't actually know. Then there were programs where uh, tools agreed upon the answer. So both said yes for input number two. But uh, even in the first competition, it occurred that there were conflicting answers where uh, on the same term right, uh, or on the same input program, uh, one tool said, no, this program is not terminating, whereas another one said, yes, it's terminating. And this, of course, indicates a bug and if one of these tools is also the only tool which could solve this problem, uh, well, we might be quite uncertain whether this really is terminating or not. But in the 2004 competition, uh, you really just got one bit of information. So just the answer, yes, no, or don't know. Okay. Therefore, the rules in the upcoming year were immediately changed, namely um, that uh, we demanded in the competition that there are at least human readable proofs. So you had uh, to have some certificate, which tells you why it's the case. And in the meanwhile, uh, so uh, one of these tools were fixed. So for this uh, input program three, now the tools agree that this would be non-terminating, but there were new problems. And here again, there were uh, conflicting answers. And of course, you could have a look at the human readable proofs, but these are sometimes very large and manual checking uh, is just often not feasible and at least error prone. Therefore, in the 2007 competition, um, there was also the option to provide machine readable proofs so that uh, others, uh, so that these proofs can be machine checked. And then for instance, uh, if you have a new problem uh, where there is a yes, no conflict, you can immediately check which of these proofs is wrong. Moreover, uh, even for this uh, input program one, where there was only one tool which could solve it, you can now uh, check the proof whether it's indeed correct. So how does it work? Um, we take the certification approach. We have on the one hand, uh, the automated tools here, um, these get the sources input, provide some yes, no answer in combination with some machine readable certificate. And then you have another program indicated by this wise owl here, which just checks uh, whether this certificate indeed corresponds to a valid termination proof and says, okay, or it may reject the proof and then 
uh, actually it might be the case uh, that the whole proof or even uh, the tool itself is bugged. Or it can also happen that the certifier just says, well, this is a termination proof I just don't understand, so I cannot say anything about it. Well, uh, having such a nice uh, looking picture here, of course, is not sufficient to be uh, reliable. So the certifiers itself, they should be reliable and therefore their soundness is proven rigorously in some proof assistant like Koch or Isabel. And um, with the help of these certifiers, several errors in tools have been detected, but also in published papers during the formalization of the termination techniques itself. And in the beginning for turnaround systems, uh, there were three certifiers available. Uh, there is the uh, Koch library on rewriting color and a corresponding front end rainbow developed by Blanqui. There was uh, the Cochinelle library uh, also for Koch and the corresponding tool Seam3 helped to generate Koch scripts. And uh, there is our own development by Christian Sternagel and myself. It's the Isabel formalization of rewriting and uh, the corresponding co-generated Haskell program, CETA. And then the rest of the talk, I will mainly speak about the evolution of ESA for CETA over the years. So we will start with how uh, termination proofs of turn right systems. We will then go over to integer transition systems, which we included in 2017. And at this point, we also got interested into SMT solving. And then we go back as indicated in the title to terminal writing, namely by um, including the weighted path order a termination technique for uh, terminal writing. What I will not cover in this talk are other features of ESA 4 uh, because of time constraints like doing checking uh, complexity proofs, confluence proofs, or uh, termination of LLVM programs. Good. So, Let's start from term writing. Of course, if uh, we want to do something formal, we should have first a formal model of term writing. So we looked at textbooks and um, there you usually find how to define term writing. So you assume that you have some signature, so symbols with arities, there is some set of variables, and then you can define uh, well-defined terms over the signature in the usual way. Um, then Based on terms, you can build a term right system. It's just a, a set of rules. Left term goes to right term, where there are certain conditions imposed that the variables on the left must be a superset of the variables of the right, and the left hand sides may not be variables. Once uh, you have settled this notion, you can define the rewrite relation just by saying whenever you have a rule, you can instantiate it by some substitution sigma and plug a context C around. And that's term rewriting. So very uh, nice crispy definition um, fits on one slide and therefore it's also not so difficult to formalize. Nevertheless, uh, when we started to formalize exactly these definitions, it actually became quite tedious uh, in doing so because there was quite some overhead and showing and maintaining uh, well-formedness of the terms all the time, uh, all the time, right? Because uh, here you only are allowed to build a term uh, of some function application if you supply the right number of arguments according to the arity. But um, well, that this is always the case and is maintained by rewriting is overhead, which we found annoying. So which somehow slowed down our progress to do interesting stuff. Therefore, in the formal version, well, we just dropped the notion of a signature. We just said, well, F is just represented by some type. Uh, in a similar way, the variables are just represented by some type. And now terms itself are just represented as an algebraic data types. So with no restrictions attached, so you can build uh, arbitrary terms with it and um, yeah there is uh, nothing which hinders you uh, to invent new symbols on the fly etc. Similarly for a term right system uh, we completely dr just drop this condition on the variables and just say well a term right system for us is nothing else than a set of pairs 
of terms. That's it. Well, the rewrite relation itself, that can be taken over as it's stated here, so there is no change required. So what ISA4 currently has is a, a very simple model of term writing, ignoring the signature, also ignoring any kind of variable conventions. So it poses no overhead. Uh, it's generic because it also allows you to reason about a rewrite system which have fresh variables on the right, which for instance was useful uh, for an external application by David Zabel. And well, however, when doing so, of course, this might bite you because it might be problematic when signatures, for instance, are crucial. So let us have one um, particular technique. Uh, in ESA4, we want to support um, recursive path order so that Zeta then can check termination proofs via, which are done by a recursive path order. So uh, here, I want to spare you the full definition of uh, the recursive path order. It just used some precedence, so some well-founded order uh, on the uh, function symbols, and then defines a relation on terms. Now, to actually certify applications of RPO, uh, we first have to define a formal version of RPO, so state the formal definition and uh, derive some theorems that this, for instance, is again a well-founded order. And we also need verified algorithms to check uh, whether two terms are in relation for a given precedence, which is uh, uh, given in the certificate of some termination proof. So um, what we do here, most of the time, we closely follow the existing proofs. I mean, we want to have uh, make a quick progress, so we don't want to invent everything from scratch. But uh, at certain points, our design decisions leads to deviations. The first problem is um, the, that we usually um, only have partial signature. So in the certificate, usually the precedence is only given and specified for the symbols in the term right system. So you have a mapping from the function symbols, say, to natural numbers where zero has lowest, lowest precedence and uh, one uh, has one precedence higher, etc. So we model precedences as mapping to the naturals. But in ESA for CETA, well, this must be extended to the precedence of all the symbols of the respective type. So uh, often uh, the type that we use here that we plug in into this type variable f are just strings. So if we, for instance, want to check uh, a termination proof for quicksort uh, term right system, then we also need to assign a precedence for the string FSCD HGAR 2020. Okay, because that's also a valid string. So it belongs to the corresponding type. But this problem is not a big issue because it could just be solved by uh, using default precedences. Internally, um, when reading a partial uh, signature, we make a total precedence out of it for all symbols by just stating, well, whatever you did not explicitly specify uh, gets the default value of zero. And then this problem is solved. Next problem, um, ESA4 usually always has infinite signatures, but um, if you want to prove termination of RPO in textbooks, they usually refer just to, well, this is an instance of Crossfield's tree theorem. However, what they use is Crossfield's tree theorem in the finite version, so for finite signatures, and this is clearly then not applicable. There is also an infinite version, but this is uh, more complex to apply. What we did there is we just searched for other alternative proofs. And for instance, for the higher order version of RPO, Horpo of Rubio and Juano, um, they used a direct inductive proof. And so um, we just uh, took their higher order recursive path ordering termination proof and used it for proving just termination of RPO itself. So there was also some positive consequence because uh, in total we get a much shorter proof uh, because the formalization of Kruskal's tree theorem uh, is no longer required. If we were to just say, well, this is an application of Kruskal's tree theorem, then we also would need a formal version of this. And Chris did this, but it was quite some effort. And 
Uh, actually, termination proof is quite simple. It's even simpler than transi proving transitivity of the order. So in numbers, uh, termination can be proved in 257 lines, whereas transitivity takes uh, 454 lines. Next problem um, is we want to check for two given terms whether they are in relation. And uh, if you implement RPO naively using the recursive definition, then uh, you end up in exponential complexity. Uh, the problem is that, for instance, if you want to compare these two terms here, then you get two recursive calls where the number n is just decreased by one. So uh, in every decrease of n, you double the number of recursive calls, which is clearly exponential. This can, of course, be uh, avoided by integrating uh, algorithms or uh, implementation techniques like memorization. Um, however, what you then use in the, such a memorized algorithm is you need access to uh, dictionaries. And of course, these have to be verified. They should be efficient and they should be verified. And our solution there is, uh, well, we don't have to do this on our own, but uh, we can use, uh, make advantage of Isabel's archive of formal proof. What is this archive of formal proof? So it's a collection of formal libraries for Isabel, which is maintained and updated for every new version of Isabel. And there we easily spotted uh, a very useful entry, namely on collections on containers uh, by Peter Lammich and Andreas Lochbieler, which we could readily use uh, to build our algorithm for memorization because they somehow provided uh, the infrastructure for dictionaries. However, not everything is there. And for instance, uh, what you need to plug in uh, some keys into some dictionaries is, at least if it's tree-based, some linear order. And we want to plug in many different uh, key types. So what we uh, did for this is we also contributed new parts to the AFP, namely uh, how to derive linear orders automatically, as in Haskell, but where in addition to the pure uh, functional program, you also get proofs that this really defines linear orders, what you get out of this. But these are just two entries. And actually, uh, ESA4 and CETA heavily relies upon the AFP. So at the moment, we have in total 32 AFP entries, which are imported. And uh, these range from algorithms uh, for dictionaries, as we have seen, but also theorems like the cauchy schwarz inequality, like SCC decomposition algorithms, algorithms for reasoning about transitive closures, algorithms for real numbers, etc. And also we on our own developed several things which we put into the AFP which were just missing. For instance, now there is the term library in the AFP, matrices for matrix interpretations, but also for instance, algebraic numbers, uh, which might come in handy if you want to check complexity proofs. A nice side effect of uh, making things public into the AFP is also that your work gets external users. For instance, there is the ESA Fall project by Blanchette and others, so Isabel formalization of logic, which for instance uses first order terms and some term ordering that we put into the AFP. And also there is uh, the linear recurrences uh, development of Manuel Eber, for instance, which uh, is, uses the algebraic numbers. So to summarize uh, what we did for certification of termination proofs for term writing is we formalized a very simple model of term writing with no explicit sig signatures. So we don't have to hassle about well-definedness proofs. Uh, the majority of termination techniques actually could easily be adapted and formalized because they actually don't depend on the signature. So all of these techniques here don't uh, take the signature really into account, uh, though there were two exceptions, namely uncurrying and uh, uh, termination techniques based on tree automata. And there we then locally added these well-definedness checks. Moreover, in our development, we tried to reuse already existing verified algorithms and theorems from the AFP whenever possible. And otherwise, uh, well, we had to formalize them and make them available afterwards. The gain is, 
what we did with this uh, development is we already detected and fixed several bugs in both tools and in papers. So let's leave term writing for a moment. So we also, in addition to term writing, want to prove termination of programs. So here you see a small uh, C program uh, for computing the binary logarithm, which iteratively uh, divides the number X by two uh, until uh, it uh, becomes zero, okay? And uh, well, a more formal setting is to use the core graph or do a core graph abstraction and then translate this into an integer transition system uh, where uh, we have here for the uh, three locations A, B, and C, we have corresponding nodes in this uh, transition system. And the formulas describe how the value of the variables changes. For instance, for phi one, which corresponds to the assignment here, we just say, okay, X prime, which corresponds to the old value of X is unchanged by this assignment. So uh, X prime is X and the new value of N, which is N prime becomes zero. And similarly, we do for the while uh, loop where we have two transitions, either we enter the loop once and stay at the beginning of the while loop or we leave the loop if X is smaller or equal than, than zero. So how do we prove termination of uh, ITSs? Um, well, a very popular technique for this is uh, just by using ranking functions. Um, this ranking function is usually then synthesized by some external tool. And what do we need to check for such a ranking function? Well, a ranking function for every loop means that, uh, first of all, the value of the ranking function with a, for the old value of the variable, so fxn, must decrease by at least one. So fxn must be greater or equal than the new value of the ranking function for the new values of x prime and n prime um, plus one. So we must have a decrease of at least one. And at the same time, since we have integers here, we must also ensure uh, that the value of the ranking function is bounded by some constant. Okay, and for instance, uh, a termination proof, then the certificate might be that for, uh, for this particular ITS, a suitable ranking function is X and a suitable constant here would be minus one. So what we have to do is now uh, to check whether these formulas that describe the decrease and the boundedness are ve really valid formulas over the integers. This, of course, validity of formulas can be turned into unsatisfiability of the negated formulas. So we have to prove that these formulas here uh, are both unsat. And then what we essentially need is an unsatisfiability checker for a set of linear inequalities. Good. So the aim now uh, in certification is we want to certify that these constraints here are unsatisfiable over the integers. Of course, a sufficient criterion would be to just require that there are unsat already over the rationals. Why consider the rationals? Because this is somehow an easy problem because it's in P and uh, there actually is a well-known decision algorithm for that, namely in form of the simplex algorithm, okay? And indeed, via the simplex algorithm, uh, we can just prove that the latter constraint here, not bound, is unsat. It's easy to see x cannot be bigger than zero and smaller than minus one at the same time. However, the problem is that the formula that we get here is satisfiable in the rational numbers. So here's a model for the formula. And actually, if we would run our uh, binary logarithm algorithm over the rational numbers, it would actually not terminate because iterated division by two uh, does not terminate in the rationals, right? I mean, you can always divide by two and never always stay positive. So what we really need is a certifier that is able to support also unsat in over the integers. And this, uh, unfortunately, is a much harder problem. So uh, satisfiability, linear integer arithmetic is NP-complete, but 
so therefore, uh, it's very unlikely that there are small certificates for ANSAT. So uh, as a consequence, we aim for developing a verified decision procedure for quantifier-free linear integer arithmetic. So what is available there for procedures? There is, for instance, Cooper's algorithm. And Cooper's algorithm is actually more general, treats a more general problem, what we actually need, because it also can deal with quantifiers. And it's nice because it has already been formalized by Nipkov and is available in the AFP. So we can just easily plug this into our tool. The problem is that this algorithm really uh, has a very high complexity. So it was just too slow on uh, practical examples for certification. So we had a look at what, uh, well, unverified tools do like Z3 or CVC4. What they use is branch and bound and simplex and cutting planes and lots of optimization. However, we cannot just defer and say, well, we just invoke these tools because these are not verified. But they are definitely fast enough. So they can solve uh, all, would be able to solve all other problems. So what we did then is we did not integrate all of these techniques, but just uh, the two very crucial ones. Namely, we developed a verified branch and bound algorithm and we did pruning via the simplex algorithm, which again was uh, already available in the AFP developed by Maric and Spasic. And actually after doing so, we were quite happy that the performance, although it is not that optimized, still uh, is kind of reasonable and definitely it's fast enough uh, for our purposes of checking termination proofs. So how does this algorithm look like? Um, I will shortly illustrate. So let's call the branch and bound algorithm BB. The input is some finite set of linear inequalities uh, interpreted as a conjunction of these um, inequalities. And the task is to either return a satisfying assignment over the integers or to detect unsatisfiability. How does it work? So first we check a satisfiability over the rational. So we invoke the simplex um, on the input. If the simplex says it's answered over the rationals, then we also say it's answered over the integers. Now, otherwise the simplex returns some satisfying assignment over the rationals. If we are lucky, then uh, this assignment is indeed an uh, integral assignment. So then we just return it. Otherwise there must be some variable which is not integral. And then we just add two more bounds to the two more inequalities. Namely, if it's not integral, then we either add that X must be smaller equal to the floor of this assignment or X must be um, bigger equal than the ceiling of this assignment. So let's see this in action. On our example, we had these constraints to prove uh, termination of the uh, logarithm example. Now, uh, we first invoke the simplex. It gives us back some rational assignment. So we now have to add this new constraint. First, we check uh, add the constraint here that x prime, which is one half, is at least one. And then the simplex says answered. So we are done with this branch. Um, or the x prime must be smaller or equal than zero. Then the simplex algorithm returns a new satisfying assignment here. And now, for instance, we see that the x is not uh, integral. So we make a case analysis whether x is big at least one, then the simplex says answered, or if x is smaller or equal than zero, and again, simplex says answered. So in total, uh, both of these branches say answered. So in total, we can also say, um, indeed, this, these constraints here uh, are unsatisfiable over the integers. However, there is a problem though. So these constraints here have the solution depicted in red here. So you see that there are no integral solution. However, when running the algorithm, well, first we get some valid assignment over the rationals. Uh, so some solution over the rationals. And then we would somehow prune the search space 
by saying, no, it cannot be here in the middle. It must be either larger than this part or lower than this integer here. So we cut out this space and now have to investigate both parts. Now let's continue with the red part. We again get a new solution and we will prune it again to cut out this part. And then we will prune here, we will prune here, prune here, prune here, prune here, etc. But uh, this would go on forever. So branch and bound in general is not terminating. And uh, the problem is that the search space a priori is unbounded. So to really verify formally that branch and bound can be used to decide satisfiability, we actually have to turn this into a terminating procedure. How do we do this? The aim is to prove the small model property. Small model property meaning that whenever some set of linear constraint has an integral solution, then there must also be a small solution or which is where all the values are within a certain bound and these bound can be pre-computed uh, via the number of variables uh, of the linear inequalities and the highest coefficient, uh, the highest numbers that occur in the linear inequalities. Okay, and once we have proven such a bound, then we can really just bound all variables via new constraint from below and above. And then we have not an infinite search space anymore, but a finite one. And then we can really decide uh, solvability. Okay. So, um, however, that this really now searching in this restricted space uh, is sound for proving answered. Uh, that uh, is some deeper result here and requires several um, theorems from linear algebra uh, to be formalized. Uh, for instance, the fundamental theorem of linear inequalities, etc. And all of these uh, theorems actually need to be there in a bounded version so that we can extract how large the numbers get in these theorems. But this has now been done and it's available in the AFP 2020. So uh, whenever you use, uh, need such a formal result, just import our theory from the AFP. Good. So to summarize, for certifying termination proofs for ITSs, um, well, ITSs are again a nice language because they, it is quite small, it has a clear semantics and is therefore similar to term writing. Um, but certification becomes much more difficult because uh, now uh, we need a verified SMT solver uh, for proving unsat of formulas. Um, th to this end, we actually used a verified SMT solver and uh, this is not as powerful as uh, Z3 and uh, CBC4, but its uh, performance is at least sufficient to check existing termination proofs. Good, so far, for the second part of my talk, let's move on to the third part. So we go back to term writing. Um, there, I want to show, speak about the weighted path order. So let me go back to uh, the year 2013, where there was a actually very exciting termination competition. Namely, there was a newcomer, NUT, uh, developed by Akiza Yamada, and it immediately got second place, so which was already uh, very remarkable. But what was even more remarkable is um, it achieved this second place by implementing just one term order. So it only supported the weighted path order. So uh, this is a really uh, important result and uh, yeah, um, indicates why it's worthwhile to study this weighted path order in more detail. Moreover, <coughs> by uh, his implementation NUT, 34 problems of the then open problems actually could only be solved by uh, the tool NUT. However, this is a new tool, uh, new ordering. So the question is, how can we be sure that these 34 open problems really are solved now? So, can, so to this end, what we did is uh, we certified the weighted path order 
And you find the corresponding paper also in the FSCD proceedings. And this is joint work with Jonas Schöpf, Christian Sternagel, and Akisa Yamada. And as a result, at least all of these 34 termination proofs could be certified. So let's now uh, go into the details. So what is uh, WPO? WPO developed by Yamada, Kusakari, and Sakabe has a structure which is very similar to RPO, the recursive path order, but integrates a weakly monotone algebra, like a polynomial interpretation or matrix interpretation. So we have <coughs> the ingredients as ingredients, the precedents as an RPO, a weakly monotone algebra, <coughs> and a status pi, uh, which is somehow similar uh, to an argument filter known from term writing uh, and dependency pairs. And how is this relation defined? Um, we have a strict relation where two terms are compared first by the corresponding uh, weakly monotone algebra, or otherwise uh, we have a um, recursive definition, uh, which I only glimpse here, which is very similar to a definition of um, an RPO with argument filters included. Moreover, there is also a non-strict uh, relation, uh, which is also not important to read here in detail, just that there are two more cases here. And what uh, Yamada et al. showed in uh, their paper is that under certain condition on the weekly monotone algebra, uh, we can prove that indeed these two relations form a reduction pair and therefore are valid for proving termination uh, using dependency pairs. Okay, so we want to formalize this. And what we could do is actually, uh, we took RPO uh, as a starting point because RPO has already been fully formalized in ESA4 and because the structure is so close uh, to WPO. So what we did is actually, um, we literally did the following. We just copied the file RPO to the file WPO -thy. So we had a new file WPO. And in this new file, we just renamed the string RPO by WPO. So afterwards, what we have is a file reading WPO, which is fully checked and accepted by Isabel, of course, still defining uh, RPO. And now we incrementally include the differences uh, between RPO and WPO into this new theory file while Isabel uh, could still check all the proofs. So we started by, for instance, adding the comparison with respect to the weekly monotone algebra. Uh, we started to integrate then the status and we started to integrate these new rules which were not present uh, in RPO. And what was nice is that Isabel pointed us directly to those proofs that need uh, adjustments. So whenever we integrate something here, Isabel will say, well, uh, proof of stability works as before, uh, proof of transitivity now breaks at this and this uh, point. So we could just do this local adjustment and continue with the next feature. So this was really uh, nice to work with. And this process went smoothly uh, for nearly all of the integrations. However, during this process, we encountered three problems I would like to mention. So first problem, the definition of RP, uh, WPO says, okay, I assume that I have some weekly monotone algebra and then define the relation uh, correspondingly. The problem is that in ESA4, there just is no notion of a weekly monotone algebra. I mean, ESA4 already has some instances of weekly monotone algebras, for instance, polynomial interpretations, matrix interpretations, arctic interpretations, but they were all formulated as if they were reduction pairs in ESA4. So we don't know that there are weekly monotone algebras formally. So the solution was just at this point to change the definition of uh, the paper definition of WPO in the formal setting. So the formal version of WPO says, well, instead of taking some weekly monotone algebra, we take some arbitrary reduction pair. 
And then instead of doing this comparisons here of S versus T in the algebra ordering, we just take the corresponding relations that we get from the reduction pair. And the rest stays uh, as it was before. So nicely, uh, the nice thing is that this change posed no problems in at all in, uh, when adjusting the proofs of WPO on paper, because the paper proofs of WPO actually never really exploit that uh, this ordering here is defined via some weakly monotone algebra. So the properties of a reduction pair are sufficient. And in fact, therefore, we actually generalized the paper version because, of course, whenever we have a weakly monotone algebra, then the relations that we use here in the comparison are a reduction pair, so they can be plugged in into the formal definition. Moreover, uh, this is really a proper generalization in the following sense. We can now even, for instance, define nested WPOs. So, for instance, we can say, okay, we take as the reduction pair a WPO to then build another WPO. Whether this uh, is useful uh, for power, uh, we did not yet investigate, um, but at least uh, from the theory side, uh, it's permitted. It's sound uh, to build reduction pairs in this way. Second problem. The second problem is um, that these two uh, cases for the non-strict relation are actually added uh, later on in the uh, paper version of WPO. And there, uh, the paper proofs are not complete anymore. So these cases, these two additions are not handled in full detail. So uh, when we try to formalize it, uh, we actually revealed um, that this last rule will break the transitivity proof of WPO in some corner cases. So, for instance, uh, you can prove with adding these rules that x is bigger than some constant c, and this constant c is bigger than a variable y, but uh, x is not uh, bigger than y in WPO. So this is clearly violates transitivity. For some very artificial um, redu underlying reduction pair, namely where uh, the non-strict relation relates everything and the strict relation is just empty. But of course, such cases may occur. But uh, luckily, this is really the only corner case because um, by excluding precisely this corner case by requiring that the strict relation is non-empty, uh, we could show that then indeed all the proofs are accomplished. And this is not only important for transitivity, because transitivity was just the first thing with breaks, uh, but other properties of WPO uh, depended, at least the proofs depended on, already on transitivity of uh, the non-strict relation. So also other things make break up. Good. In total, what we have at the end is a formalized theorem that uh, if we have the precondition that uh, the non-strict relation is simple, and we have this new mild precondition, then indeed we have a reduction pair. Good. So WPO can be used. However, there's also a third problem. And the third problem um, is about what uh, are actually instances of these um, uh, reduction pairs or this weekly monotone algebras. And a very popular instance or a very powerful instance also is by using max polynomial interpretations. If you don't know what a max polynomial interpretation is, well, it's just like a polynomial interpretation where you assign to each nary symbol um, an arithmetic expression which can use uh, numbers, addition, multiplication, but additionally, the maximum operator. So for instance, you can say that uh, I measure an if then else uh, by the maximum of the last two arguments. And the list constructor cons might be a standard polynomial like uh, list length uh, one plus uh, the length of the second argument. Okay. 
So these interpretations were not available in ESA 4 when integrating WPO, but for certifying uh, the proofs, we of course wanted it because it's often used in combination with WPO. So to this end, uh, we of course had to formalize that indeed max polynomial interpretations are a reduction pair. And this formalization is indeed straightforward. So there was uh, no complications arose at that point. The real third problem is how do you actually check whether two terms are in relation? So to this end, you actually have to compare max polynomials, okay? And our solution that we used in CETA uh, follows an approach uh, indicated by Ben Amram and Kodish. So uh, we actually normalize the max polynomial expressions so that the maximum is moved to the outside. So we have addition, uh, if we have a maximum inside an addition, we move it outside with this rule. And if we have a maximum inside a multiplication, we move it outside with this rule. And the second rule might look fishy. Uh, however, since we are only working over the natural numbers here, uh, this rule really uh, is an equivalence. As a result, what we get is interpretations of the term S and T of the form uh, a big maximum operator on the outside and uh, in there are ordinary polynomials uh, as we know them from polynomial interpretations. So what we can do is we can transform such a term constraint into the corresponding max polynomial constraint. And then this, if all of the maxes are outside, we can equivalently express that as a conjunction of a disjunction over polynomial inequalities, okay? So we have now a formula over natural number arithmetic. And this we can now pass to our verified SMT solver, which we developed for uh, ITSs. So this is now very handy because what we do is we just pick this uh, resulting formula and additionally plug in that all the variables that occur in there are indeed natural numbers by adding the constraints that the, uh, they are bounded from below by zero. And um, then we are done. And it's nice to have this verified solver because without this verified solver, so getting for instance help uh, via certificates, this would become very bulky. Because for checking a single WPO constraint, what you do is you do this uh, comparisons with respect to the weekly monotone algebra for all subterms of the corresponding constraint. So you get in total n, at least n, uh, uh, roughly n squared many invocations to check whether some uh, terms are related in the weekly monotone algebra. And if you want to provide hints for all of these comparisons, that would be a big overhead in the certificates. Therefore, we are happy uh, that we can just invoke the verified SMT solver there. We also did some experiments in this work. So um, WPO is integrated both in uh, NUT and now also in TTT2. And we compare two settings, uh, namely one version of NUT where everything is allowed and one where NUT is restricted to the certifiable setting and similar for TTT2. And what we see is that we get uh, quite some low penalty and power. So if we restrict to the certifiable mode, we only lose a few percent of the proof. So for NUT, we lose 14% and for TTT2, even only 9% of the proving power. So uh, you uh, restricting to certifiable techniques uh, is not that severe. Uh, even less severe is that uh, the price you have to pay for additional time, because if you see the time to find and synthesize the tool is by far more than the time to afterwards check the uh, corresponding um, proofs by, by CETA. So it's 9% for NUT and 0.4% for TTT2. However, there is also a big gain, namely uh, what you gain is reliability. 
So uh, all of these 700 plus 750 proofs here are now uh, really checked proofs or trustworthy proofs. Good. To summarize my talk, uh, what I presented here, and I hope I was able to convince you that a certification of termination proofs is worthwhile. It's also feasible. Uh, all the more, uh, well, it becomes um, gradually more feasible because all of the existing libraries grow uh, in the whole Isabel community and also, I guess, in Coq and Lean communities, etc. And of course, it's also fun. So. Uh, you get insights into a lot of topics. So uh, at the beginning, well, uh, my background is from terminal writing, but then I had to study linear algebra, I had to study algebraic numbers, etc. And delving into these topics uh, was just uh, nice. What we usually do is uh, we try to keep our formalization sim as simple as possible and therefore sometimes deviate from the textbook definitions. Uh, what we heavily base on is the AFP because uh, it offers many verified algorithms and also uh, proofs, uh, which we need for our uh, developing even larger proofs. Verified SMT solvers are now becoming essential for certification of termination proofs, not only for ITSs, but also for terminal writing because of uh, the WPO development. And this WPO really is correct. So uh, it can be used in termination proofs after adding a mild precondition. And everything of this resulted in our certifier CETA, which is currently used uh, in the termination competition uh, to check thousands of termination proofs. And actually also it's used in the termination upcoming termination competition, which will be presented live at ICHCA. Um, on July the 4th. That's it from my side and I thank you for watching. So thank you to Rene for this very nice talk and uh, I do not know how to to clap in, uh, in this virtual setting so I will uh, just uh, open the questions. You can ra raise your hand uh, otherwise, there is already a question sent on the question and answer by young girl Smaus. So maybe you can just uh, uh, ask your question by yourself. Now okay. you are allowed okay. to talk. Please ask your question. Uh, okay, so thank, thank you for letting me ask the question. So there was just some uh, inequality involving a plus one uh, and a greater equal than and at that point I was wondering if there was a reason why not say uh, greater than and omit the plus one I maybe maybe it was answered a little bit later but maybe you can still comment on that okay I guess you're referring to this uh, slide here where we had the decrease by at least one absolutely, um, absolutely. so initially when we did this um, reasoning um, we didn't have the support of uh, linear uh, of linear integer arithmetic. Uh, so what we did at that point is uh, we interpreted everything over linear rational arithmetic, and then there is a difference between x is bigger than uh, x prime, or x is bigger equal than x prime plus one. So on the integers, this is equivalent, but um, yeah. Usually we normalize it. Usually we normalize away everything. So on the integers, we would eliminate all strict equalities and turn them into uh, plus one constructions and use non-strict equalities. Okay, thank you. But but at that point, formally, you might have, you might have just as well chosen plus two or plus three it wouldn't have made a difference from formally, right? Well, here, of course, uh, well, uh, a decrease of one would already be uh, sufficient. So why should we mm -hmm. add um, more uh, restrict uh, to to require a decrease of at least two or three? So yeah. somehow yeah. the least amount of decrease uh, that is possible. If we would or, go or, over or the zero point five or zero point yeah, five. Yeah, sure. Minutes. Over the rationals, yeah. that would be yeah. done. So it's just and some kind of epsilon. It, it's just kind of epsilon. And actually mm -hmm. for, for checking termination proofs with... Uh, um, for term writing, there are also 
polynomial interpretations over the rationals, we do just that. So there we can specify some arbitrary value epsilon, which is positive. Okay, thank you. Uh, should I answer the question of Stefan Kaas? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, Stefan Kaas asked, I don't know whether all, you can all see the question. Well, you mentioned that there are several checkers for termination proofs. Is there an agreed language for what these proofs need to look like? Um, well, uh, initially, there was none. So initially, actually, what I presented here... Um, there are the three certifiers, color rainbow, cochinel seam, and isa for Sita, and all of them uh, had their own language how to express proofs. But this was, of course, very inconvenient uh, for the termination tools if they would, uh, if they would have to support uh, three different proof formats at the same time. And therefore, later on, there was some agreed format. It's the certification proof format, CPF, uh, which was developed uh, as a collaboration of all of these three certifiers, uh, and it is uh, openly available now. Uh, yes, still extended to new um, methods, and yeah, there is this agreement now. And what does it look like? Well, it's an XML format uh, which uh, mainly indicates the proof structure. So, for instance, I applied first. Uh, say uh, dependency pairs, then I do SCC decomposition, and then I use RPO for this with this precedence, and for the other strongly connected component, I use that relation. Or for ITSs, uh, it would be like, well, combine these three ranking functions lexicographically, etc., or uh, include some invariants, and here are the invariants, etc. So this is the level of detail uh, that is expressed there. Thank you. The, are there other questions, please? Uh, is, uh, don't be shy. You can uh, either raise your hand or uh, ask in the question answer. I'll, I'll let you. So there is a question in the chat by Manuel. OK, I, I, I will let you ask your question directly, Manuel. Please. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. So uh, you said that you saw you compared these max polynomials using uh, your SMT approach, but that was only for linear integer arithmetic, and polynomials are nonlinear. So how does that work? Okay. Um, good point. Uh, well observed. Uh, what we do there is we first uh, linearize. Uh, so somehow, whenever I say, for instance, there is an x square we would invent a fresh uh, variable at that point and add additionally the constraint that uh, this new variable is at least zero. So we try to infer some more knowledge. But uh, yes, you are right uh, that they are, uh, well, we can only have a decision procedure if it's really, if the input was uh, for linear integer arithmetic, but there is a pre-processing which at least preserves um, in a way that validity of the resulting linearized formula implies uh, validity of the nonlinear formula. Mm -hmm. But these are multivariate polynomials as well, right? Yes. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, so, so, so if like you X have something, y. yeah, if you have x times y, then you add a, a new variable, replace x times y by a fresh variable z. And then you don't have any information about what Z is. And what do you do if, you, if this is too coarse, this approximation? Oh, then we just fail. Okay. <laughs> then we just say in the, I mean, what you get here, uh, uh, I show it here, um, either you get an okay or you get a reject. And the reject is usually a detailed error message why CETA believes that your proof is not correct. And sometimes it explicitly says, well, this does not hold. And sometimes it's also said, well, uh, here it might be wrong. We at least couldn't figure it out. So uh, the kind of error message indicates whether we use some approximation 
at some point, point or not. Okay. So there is another question by uh, Ariane uh, Almeida. So please, Ariane, you can ask your question now. Can you hear me, Ariane? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, please. Yeah. Please so, ask uh, your question. You showed different uh, strategies for proving termination, uh, some for rewriting systems and some for uh, programs, right? So the thing is, uh, we can use these different strategies for uh, the other setting. I mean, use the strategies that we have for rewriting systems to prove termination of programs and vice versa. And what do you think would be necessary to do so? Yeah, I mean, what you can do there at the moment, uh, honestly, uh, no, we don't support this. So there is no uh, translation between uh, the two of them. Um, however, if you have different input formats, what you can of do, of course, do is to simulate the one system uh, and translate it into the other one and ver verify that this translation is non-termination preserving. So that termination of the resulting system implies termination of the other one. And mm -hmm. once we would have such a verified translation in there, uh, then, of course, it could be coupled and you can switch between the two formalism. But without such a verified translation, uh, it's not possible. And this is what we also, which I pointed at uh, in this um, second approach where we uh, went from the C program uh, to the ITS. Online. Oh. Uh, so, we went from the C program to this ITS, that this actually, this ITS really proves termination of the C program is currently not formally verified, uh, but uh, we are working on it and to develop uh, a verified translation from this formalism into that one. I mean, this was already done by other peoples, but we do it formally now and, and verify the translation. And, uh, such translations are already uh, formalized to a certain extent within the realm of um, term rewriting, where, for instance, you take conditional rewrite systems and transform them into uh, unconditional term rewrite systems. So, uh, for instance, uh, uh, by uh, unraveling techniques. And this, for instance, has been uh, formally verified and can be indeed used. Okay, thank you. I don't know. So if there are no more questions, let's thanks. Um... Uh, René again for his nice talk and uh, thank you everybody for watching for attending this first uh, session therefore uh, we shall uh, have uh, we'll have a coffee break we shall we, there is a, a virtual coffee break 